In the choice of the most powerful and abominable, <laughs> the idea of the Mythos, will you be Team Mathothoth or Team Josephoth? <laughs> I mean, if they faced each other, what do you think will win? <sighs> I confess that I'm always Team Mathothoth. El pasado 18 de noviembre tuve la suerte, el gusto y el honor de entrevistar al mayor experto mundial, sin exagerar, en la figura literaria de Howard Philip Lovecraft y los mitos de Cthulhu. Un hombre que ha dedicado 50 años de su vida a estudiar de manera profesional los orígenes del gran maestro, su traumática infancia y adolescencia, su trabajo, sus amores, sus anhelos insatisfechos y su triste final. Un erudito que entrevistó, por ejemplo, a la persona que acompañó a Lovecraft el mismo día antes de su marcha hacia ese lugar donde aguardan los grandes de la historia. Porque parafraseando a una compañera de oficio, si Lovecraft fuera Dios, este hombre sería el Papa. Y no solo me propongo presentaros toda la entrevista, sino que también tengo intención de presentaros después mis impresiones sobre este magnífico encuentro. Ya que tuve la oportunidad de acompañar a este intelectual durante la práctica totalidad del día. Por desgracia no pude hacerle todas las preguntas que tenía preparadas y las pocas que le pude presentar lo tuve que hacer muy rápido porque disponíamos de muy poco tiempo. Pero igualmente sí reconoceréis algunas de las preguntas que me propusisteis. Mis queridos hermanos, sin duda vamos a grabar hoy el que resulta el capítulo más importante de toda la historia de este canal. Y es que eh, hoy tenemos el honor de contar con la presencia del gran ST Yoshi la eminencia mundial máximo erudito de la literatura lovecraftiana. Porque ya sabemos que su pasión y su dedicación no solamente ha inspirado a académicos, sino también a, a lectores y a escritores, entre los cuales me incluyo. And most importantly, he also loves cats. <laughs> Mr. Yossi, thank you for being in this, your home, the Olmedo Horror Books Channel. Y es que gran cantidad de capítulos del mito nauta lo he basado en fragmentos de su trabajo. S.T. Yoshi, un erudito original de la India nacido en 1958, que ha dedicado la práctica totalidad de su vida a desentrañar los secretos de la mente de Lovecraft y de la impronta que éste ha dejado en el corazón de los autores posteriores. Con un currículum académico impresionante que incluye un grado con maestría en filología clásica en la Universidad de Brown, la misma que Lovecraft adoraba, por lo que no es para nada casual, y que también fue aceptado en la Universidad de Princeton para hacer un doctorado. Pero no lo terminó porque, ojo, esta actividad le restaba tiempo a su verdadera pasión, la búsqueda incansable de la comprensión de la mente del gran maestro. Esto le ha llevado a terminar haciendo amistad con grandes autores referentes del género o incluso codearse con personas que de un modo u otro llegaron a estar conectadas con Howard Philip Lovecraft, un compendio de esfuerzo que indudablemente le ha llevado a convertirse en un autor prolífico con más de 25 libros publicados, cientos de ensayos y artículos y varios premios internacionales que no hacen otra cosa que manifestar su merecida posición en la cima del género. Ok, so Mr. Yoshi, um, according to your own biography, you state that you discovered Lovecraft at the early age of 13, which left an extraordinary impression on you. The question is, how did that first encounter happen, which, like the first kiss, is never forgotten? Well, I believe I was in uh, eighth or ninth grade, in mm -hmm. uh, uh, living in the Midwest of the United States, uh, uh, the state of Indiana. Yeah. And at that time, and I believe even now, there was a publishing company, Scholastic Book Services, that offered, uh, you know, paperback books to, to school children at a very small price, uh, 95 cents, something like that. And I found this anthology. I'd already been interested in the horror story. Uh, I had read some Poe, probably, and some other anthologies by uh, Alfred Hitchcock, uh, whatever. And so this uh, anthology by Betty Owen called Eleven Great Horror stories. The very <laughs> first <right> story. <laughs> the very first story was H.P. Lovecraft's The Dunwich Horror. Now, a very long no, no, story. No. Now, I have to confess, I don't distinctly recall my first impressions of reading it. Mm. I just remember this vague atmosphere of, you know, strangeness in in uh, the backwoods of New England. You know, as an as an immigrant from India mm -hmm. living in the Midwest, I had very little knowledge of New England, but that world that he was creating struck me as extraordinary. Um, and so later, mm -hmm. after reading this story, I went to my public library and come upon the uh, three volumes of Lovecraft stories published <laughs> by Arkham House. Arkham and that, House. Was, yeah. that was my real downfall. Perfect. So um, you began in Lovecraft with the horror of Dunwich. 
Apparently. <risa> yes. Apparently. Ok. <risa> Ese tello sí conoció al gran maestro a través del horror de Dunwich. Yo empecé con la sombra sobre Ismuth, pero ¿cuál fue vuestro bautizo en los mitos de Cthulhu? Dejadlo por favor en los comentarios. A ver cuántos coincidí con el señor Yoshi. What did your parents think of their son wanting to dedicate his professional career to the study of this strange and unpopular writer who passed away a century ago instead of becoming a well-known economist or mathematician? <laughs> well, my parents just, they wanted me to pursue what I wanted to pursue. Uh, That's perfect. At the time, I was trying to be a fiction writer. Uh, not very successful, of course. It's very hard at that age to, to write anything decent. Uh, but I tried, and I wrote lots and lots of material, but uh, I eventually shifted to uh, criticism, and found a little more success there, because at this time, in the 1970s, Lovecraft was just starting to become popular in the U.S., and more than that, there was a very small group of people who were interested in taking Lovecraft to a higher level. They mm -hmm. felt that Lovecraft was underappreciated as a literary figure, all apart from his popularity. Okay. And I got in touch with some of these people, and they really helped me to... Uh, To, to become a Lovecraft scholar. Oh, there is no doubt that the results were extraordinary. Mm. <laughs> uh, because, for example, I have read in your book that you personally interviewed Frank Bernard Long. Uh, have you been able to personally interview uh, other members of the cycle? Y well, um, yeah, I got to know Frank quite well. Uh, I myself, eventually, after college, uh, moved to New York City. Oh, that's and so he was living there. He was a very old man, of course, at that time. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I met him quite frequently with others in our group, uh, and it, it was fascinating to think that here was this man who, 50 years earlier, had actually known and spoken to Lovecraft, met him on many, many occasions. It would take a while to talk to Long about himself mm -hmm. uh, to finally get him to, to reveal some memories wow. of Lovecraft. He didn't want to be approached as just somebody who knew Lovecraft. He felt he was an important writer <laughs> yeah. in his own right. And so you had to sort of, as we say in America, butter him up, <laughs> make him feel yes. uh, appreciated before he's, he, he would talk about oh, that. Was awesome. Muy posiblemente muchos de vosotros ya sabéis quién es Frank Belknap Long. Y para el que no lo conozca, tengo que destacar que fue uno de los mayores amigos que el gran maestro tuvo y que también formó parte de su círculo de autores consagrados. De hecho, Lovecraft conoció a la que fuera su esposa, Sonia Green, por aquellos tres dificultosos años en el piso de Frank Bernard Long en Nueva York. Pues eso, que este escritor de lo fantástico fue el creador del magnífico relato Los perros de Tíndalos. Well, focusing now on our admired grandmaster, uh, as we like to call him in our channel, uh, one thing that caught my attention and that you note in your book is that his paternal grandfather found a Masonic lodge in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about that? Well, yes, that was that was a, a fashionable thing in this oh, days. Okay. There was nothing particularly sinister okay. about that. The Masons, or the Freemasons, I think is the official mm -hmm. name, uh, were, uh, I believe, what in uh, America is called a fraternal organization. A, l a number of businessmen mm -hmm. uh, did that. It was sort of an early version. Again, I don't know if you have it here. Is We have a rotary organization where businessmen get together to talk and uh, over a meal and, and maybe even conduct some business. So there was nothing particularly <laughs> odd about that. Okay. Continuing with his childhood, uh, Lovecraft admitted that he did not remember well Why he used the name Abdul al mm. And But is there any recent information that could clarify uh, if there was any prior inspiration aside from his liking for Middle Asia civilization? I mentioned this in relation to the famous legend of Abdul al has read. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you mm -hmm. know That's it. an interesting thing. Uh, I have, a, okay, Lovecraft did say in a letter that it was a f the family lawyer, his name was Albert Baker, who gave that name uh, uh, to told Lovecraft to use that name. Ah. Uh, yeah, and I have a feeling, I'm, it would be interesting to think it was about reading, but I think Lovecraft in his ancestry had a, a, a family name of Hazard. Uh, mm -hmm. That was a family name uh, yes. in, yeah. in Rhode Island. So I think that the, the, the lawyer may have been thinking of that. <laughs> it is a bad name by Arabic <laughs> standards. It's ungrammatical Arabic, <laughs> but, but let that pass. Very bad name. There's another piece of information that I found in your book particularly interesting, and that is that Lovecraft claimed to have recorded various covers of song, sung by himself. 
uh, on a phonograph. Uh, however, he also claimed to have destroyed the record, so there is no evidence of what his voice really sounded like. Um, is that entirely true? Because I haven't come across most likely a fake, uh, a brief audio with HPL's supposed voice introducing, I believe, a presentation of the work of London Sunny. I'm sorry, that is a fake. <laughs> it's a fake. It is unquestionable. <laughs> I uh, suppose there are so. lots of uh, people <laughs> yeah, who have really. tried to uh, f do fake films of, of Lovecraft, you know, uh, in, in what is called the news reels. Uh, they're all fake. Yeah. Uh, there is no uh, film of Lovecraft. There is no voice recording of Lovecraft. Uh, what most people say, especially his wife and others who knew him, is that he had a somewhat high-pitched voice. Yes. But uh, his wife, Sonia, in particular, mm -hmm. thought he had a very sweet singing voice and he indeed sang uh, uh the what are called barbershop uh, tunes uh yes. when he was a, a mm -hmm. boy a teenager uh and indeed he didn't record them but then he says oh i i, I broke those records because <laughs> he, he was embarrassed uh, but he probably had a very good voice yes. Y es que Lovecraft, a pesar de medir 1,80 y llegar a pesar hasta los 92 kilos cuando vivía con su esposa en Nueva York, resultaba una persona de voz un tanto aflautada y con el rostro lleno de granitos de acné y bello facial enconado que lo duró hasta más allá de los 30 años. Una cuestión que no hizo otra cosa que alimentar la pérdida de autoestima de Lovecraft ya denostada con insistencia por su propia madre. And another interesting fact about the Grandmaster that we can find in your work is that HPL Cool will be a sort of literary hater <laughs> of, of his time. It is known as is he ever had any serious altercation in person and must commit to blows or at least to deliver an insult in person. No, I don't no. think so. Lovecraft, as I say, whatever he may have been on paper, and sometimes he could be very uh, sharp yes. uh, against other writers or other people he didn't like, in person, he always wanted to conduct himself as a mm -hmm. gentleman. Mm -hmm. That was his code of honor. Uh, and so I don't believe he had any personal mm -hmm. uh, uh, fights. Uh, maybe <laughs> as a boy, uh, we all do as boys, uh, but not, not as an old man. Okay. Casi todos conocemos las múltiples complicaciones que existieron en el corto matrimonio de Lovecraft y Sonia Green. Pero muy pocos saben que el gran maestro pudo tener en realidad un amor anterior, el cual, como nos va a ilustrar el señor Josie a continuación, podría haber sido mucho más genuino que el de Sonia Green. Os hablo de Winifred Virginia Jackson, la joven con la que Lovecraft colaboró para escribir el magnífico relato El caos reptante. We all know what a peculiar person or my HPL was, and, and a very notable anecdote you mentioned in your book is that the Grandmaster actively protected himself from falling prey to infatuation, mm. <laughs> uh, considering it a ridiculous form of losing control over oneself. However, what really happened between Winifred Jackson and Lovecraft? Mm. <laughs> what is a platonic love between them or something else? Because in your work, I read that Sonia Green claimed in her memories that she stole Jackson's boyfriend, but Jackson, in turn, had an American lover. Uh, even HPL secretly took a photograph of Jason of Jackson on the beach. <laughs> what really happened between them? I wish we knew. Um, <laughs> Lovecraft, I think, again, this was part of his gentlemanly uh, standing. Mm -hmm. I think it is clear that Jackson, who is, by the way, 14 years 14 older years than old. Lovecraft, uh, but very beautiful woman, mm -hmm. uh, I think she was attracted to Lovecraft. Uh, intellectually and perhaps even e emotionally. Mm -hmm. uh, they did a lot of work together. They, they edited a magazine together, uh, things like this. They met frequently in the Boston area. There may have been something. And I think if Sonia had not shown up uh, in 1921, mm -hmm. maybe Lovecraft would have <laughs> developed this romance because I think he was, he was quite uh, strongly attached to her. Lovecraft posiblemente enamorado de una mujer 14 años más grande que él y que finalmente se casó con Sonia Green que también era 8 años más grande que él. Continuing with his wife with Sonia and um, I'm presenting you this question with great skepticism. Uh, what proof is there in the rumors about some possible connection of Sonia with esotericism? Mm -hmm. esotericism. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that it's very common to associate Lovecraft with the practice of occultism, following the works of Kenneth Grant and his Tiffonian cult, etc. Uh, because it's true that Lovecraft was too atheist to approach any kind of mystical or religious mm -hmm. congregation. But what was he like, his wife? Um, I think that is also a what is called an internet rumor. Uh, yes. Uh, it, it never we happened. Uh, I believe that uh, people uh, have established that maybe Alistair Crowley was 
mm-hmm. living in yes. the New York City area oh. at the time that Sonia was there. Mm-hmm. But there is absolutely no evidence okay. uh, that Sonia had any contact with him. I thought the same. Que si queréis conocer de dónde surgen los rumores sobre la relación de Lovecraft con el ocultismo, os recuerdo que le dedicamos todo un capítulo del mitonauta. Eh, we'll change in now to the other side of the river, focusing on the creative side of Grandmaster. Uh, of our grandmaster. In your book, you talk about the most intriguing story never found by HPL, Life and Death. This reminds me of that legend about the grandmaster wrote a cosmic horror tale based on the evolution of his fatal illness, mm-hmm. which remained unfinished. How much, how much truth or falsehood is there in that? No, I, uh, Life and Death must be out there somewhere. It's probably a very short piece, a very cosmic piece. Yes. You know, um, It were, that is the, I think it is the one genuine story of Lovecraft that is out there and has not been mm-hmm. found. This other story that you mentioned, I think that's a myth. <laughs> I don't think he was... Okay. But at the end of his life, he was simply incapacitated. Yes. He, for months and months, he really couldn't do much of anything. He was in very poor health. Mm-hmm. Probably wouldn't have been able to write. That's uh, totally logic. Yeah. Yes, I know. Qué triste es saber que nuestro gran maestro finalmente terminó muriendo solo en una cama de hospital. Visitado en lejanas ocasiones por algunos amigos casi en la indigencia después de meses de una incapacitante agonía. Uh, in connection with the canon of Posthumous works, what's your point of view on the changes introduced in the cosmogony by August the Less after his after HPL's death? Do you think they were positive or negative? I think they were negative. Uh, I think so. Derleth never really understood yes, Lovecraft think, or same. his stories. He interpreted these works through his own Mm -hmm. uh, religious lens. He was Mm -hmm. a a devout Catholic. And so the original Cthulhu mythos, as Lovecraft conceived of it, is a very dark and atheistic place. Mm -hmm. Uh, Even though there are gods, they're not really gods. They're they're aliens from outer space. Derleth could not deal with that kind of uh, 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 imagery and and perspective. Uh, As a Catholic, he felt he needed to uh, 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 reshape the mythos to his liking, and I think that was a, a bad result. Ay, Darleth, ¿cuántos somos los que te rechazamos y amamos al mismo tiempo? Porque es verdad que pulverizaste la visión del cosmicismo original para reorientar los mitos hacia tu maniqueísmo simplista. Pero si no hubiera sido por tu ilusión y tu pasión, el trabajo de Lovecraft habría quedado de por siempre perdido en el espacio y en el tiempo. So, uh, and now I must ask you, but they have been proposed to me so many times on the channel that mm. I feel obligated to ask them. Mm-hmm. In the choice of the most powerful and abominable <laughs> deity of the mythos, would you be Team Azathoth or Team Josephoth? <laughs> I mean, if they <sighs> faced each other, what do you think will win? <sighs> I confess that I'm always Team Azathoth. It's so hard to say. Azathoth, I think by design, is ill-defined. Mm-hmm. He may indeed be at the summit of Lovecraft's pantheon of gods or monsters. Yes. Uh, Lo- Yog sothoth is a more active god, it would appear. Mm-hmm. I mean, he actually appears in the Dunachar, actually yeah, mates, true. mates with a human being and produces offspring. Uh, he appears in other guises and other stories. So he, 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 he seems to be around the universe more than Azathoth. I think Azathoth is almost a pure symbol. A symbol of the of the meaninglessness of the universe. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is how he's described as a blind idiot god, which means that the universe mm-hmm. has no significance. It has no purpose or meaning. Yes. And, and uh, that is very entangled with the cosmicism. Yeah. Entonces podemos concluir que el señor Yoshi es Tim Yoxozov. Pero de qué equipo serías tú? Dejadlo en los comentarios. Vamos a ver cuál tiene más seguidores. Sadly, the, the last question we have. Um, if you had HPL in front of you. And could propose just one question. What will it be? Oh, that's a tough one. I, I could, I'm sure <laughs> if I had... You can ask a tough oh, questions. <laughs> if I had Lovecraft with me, I, there would be no end of discussion <laughs> with him. Because, as I say, I've spent 50 years studying him and I could, the, the, there's so much I would like to talk about. <laughs> um, I would like to know what his feelings about his father mm. were. I think the, the loss of his father for, at a very early age had a real impact on his life, his emotions, and perhaps even his writing. I think that the absence of the father, even if you're not a, a Freudian psychologist, yes. is a very important thing. And I'd like to know, what did you think of your father? Do you remember him? Uh, what was it like to live with your mother for so many years all by yourself? And when she himself herself was declining mentally. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think what amazes me about Lovecraft is 
he had actually had a very difficult childhood uh, given these uh, this parental influence and yet he recovered mm -hmm. and i think he recovered through writing writing was almost like a therapy to him to uh, to surmount these emotional difficulties that he faced uh, as a boy i understand that was a, a totally passionate uh, question for me uh, well, I don't want to steal more your precious <laughs> time. <laughs> Mr. Joshi, I insist you on expressing my sincere thanks mm. uh, for this unique opportunity and what a wet away by give you the last word for our community. Well, I'll channel. tell you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've been reading La Ferre for 50 years, but I still admire him and I still look at him in different ways. As you age, uh, as everybody ages, your own interests differ mm -hmm. and, and change. And now I look at Lovecraft as a mind, as an intellect, as someone who lived in that time, a very interesting time of history. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why I love he reading his letters. I've published almost all of his letters. Uh, and every one of them reveals a, a fascinating glimpse into his state of mind uh, at this very uh, critical period of, of American and world history. I understand perfectly well your your feeling. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, Mr. Joshi, to be here. Wonderful I'll to be here. The place. Thank you. No me cabe duda de que sois capaces de imaginar qué tipo de sentimiento podía inundar mi corazón durante aquellos momentos. Estaba especialmente nervioso. Y creedme cuando os digo que hacía décadas que no me ponía así. Y es que cuando uno ama el horror cósmico y todo lo que de él surge, es inevitable tener a ST Yoshi como una fuente de inspiración. Pero es que si la entrevista ya de por sí fue un momento inolvidable, quedó más tarde ensombrecido cuando el propio señor Yoshi y su mujer nos invitaron amablemente a mi esposa y a mí a compartir con ellos un refrigerio, la hora y media que aguardaba hasta su siguiente participación. Eso sí que fue para derretirse de gozo, porque os prometo que es totalmente imposible escucharle hablar y no quedar embriagado por su pasión por el gran maestro y su obra. Se nota claramente que el estudio del trabajo de Lovecraft no ha sido para él una obligación, sino prácticamente una forma de vida. Y esto lo volvimos a confirmar a la caída de la tarde, cuando la organización cultural Sui Generis Madrid, a la que le estaré eternamente agradecido, volvió otra vez a reunirnos a todos los autores invitados para tomar un aperitivo. Dos horas y media adicionales en las que nos sentimos como si fuéramos niños escuchando a su abuelo alrededor del fuego, contar las fascinantes historias de su juventud. Porque el señor Yoshi es un hombre especialmente encantador, muy cercano y afable, pero al mismo tiempo de una solemne elegancia y exquisita educación, una que bien podría recordarnos a esa característica caballerosidad victoriana. Con todo esto sumado al ineludible embrujo de su conocimiento, se vuelve prácticamente imposible no sentirse abrumado por un imponente respeto, y es que es imposible no sentirse pequeño ante su presencia. Por lo demás, la experiencia en el evento fue todo un regalo de la vida, una recompensa a la constancia. Es por eso que siempre agradeceré sin cansarme a las compañeras organizadoras de la Asociación Cultural de Sarilia en su plataforma de cultura alternativa Sui Generis Madrid por esta increíble oportunidad, porque pude conoceros en persona a muchos de vosotros, compartir algunas palabras y firmar de paso vuestros numerosos ejemplares de mis novelas. No os podáis hacer una idea de la ilusión que me hacía el veros sacar de vuestras bolsas y mochilas un buen montón de ejemplares. Pero lo mejor y más importante de todo es la pasión que transmitíais hacia mi trabajo como autor y como divulgador, el modo en el que este esfuerzo ha llegado a inspirar muchos de vuestros propios proyectos. Y resultaba conmovedor descubrir cómo os ibais acumulando más y más personas en la cola de firmas. Hasta el punto de tenerme dos horas firmando sin parar. Por eso muchísimas gracias mis queridos hermanos por regalarme aquellos emotivos instantes. Muchísimas gracias a todos los que allí estuvisteis y a los que os hubiera gustado estar. Y a colación de esto tengo una interesante noticia que anunciaros. Y es que a partir de ahora y con exclusividad... Existirá en España un único establecimiento físico al que también podréis acudir para adquirir cualquiera de mis obras. Porque además de en Amazon, como siempre, desde hoy, todas mis novelas se encontrarán también en la boutique de Zocique, un establecimiento en el mismo Madrid. Una librería especializada en la narrativa exótica y en la literatura extraña. Os dejo el enlace en la descripción. Ah, y YouTube nos ha informado a los creadores de contenido que ha incluido una actualización para que cuando digamos suscríbete o dale a like, aparezca una suerte de animación en el botón de subscribe o dar like y que si lo pulsas salen como fuegos artificiales. Ya estáis tardando en probarlo para ver si funciona o no. ¡Caramba! Y una última cosa. ¿Os acordáis que hemos hablado antes sobre la posible conexión de Lovecraft y Sonia Green con el ocultismo? 
Pues como antes os dije, en este capítulo del mito nauta revelamos los entresijos de cómo se generó esa leyenda. Porque era entonces Lovecraft conocedor del ocultismo, échale un vistazo al vídeo y saca tus propias conclusiones. 